This week, the NTSB determines the probable cause of the G650 flight test accident last year. Felix Baumgartner will not attempt his record-setting free fall before Sunday. And Dragon delivers cargo to the International Space Station. I'm Ashley Hale. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. The NTSB met Wednesday and determined that the probable cause of the crash of an experimental Gulfstream G650 on April 2, 2011 in Roswell, New Mexico was the result of an aerodynamic stall and uncommand roll during a planned takeoff test flight conducted with only one of the airplane's two engines operating. The board found that the crash was the result of Gulfstream's failure to properly develop and validate takeoff speeds and recognize and correct errors in the takeoff safety speed that manifested during previous G650 flight tests. The flight test team's persistent and aggressive attempts to achieve a takeoff speed that was erroneously low and Gulfstream's inadequate investigation of uncommand roll events that occurred during previous flight tests. Contributing to the accident the NTSB found was Gulfstream's pursuit of an aggressive flight test schedule without ensuring that the roles and responsibilities of team members were appropriately defined, sufficient technical planning and oversight was performed, and that hazards had been fully identified and addressed with appropriate effective risk controls. The SpaceX Dragon spacecraft was berthed to the International Space Station at 0803 Central Time on Wednesday, a key milestone in a new era of commercial spaceflight. The delivery flight is the first contracted resupply mission by the company under NASA's Commercial Resupply Services contract. Following its capture, the spacecraft was attached to the Earth-facing port of the Harmony node. The capsule is scheduled to spend 18 days attached to the station before returning for a splashdown in the Pacific Ocean off the Southern California coast. Dragon delivered 882 pounds of supplies to the orbiting laboratory, including 260 pounds of crew supplies, 390 pounds of scientific research, 225 pounds of hardware, and several pounds of other supplies. Dragon will return a total of 1,673 pounds, including 163 pounds of crew supplies, 866 pounds of scientific research, and 518 pounds of vehicle hardware and other hardware. But the engine problem experienced by the Falcon 9 rocket on launch meant that a secondary payload did not reach its planned orbit. A satellite built by Orbcom was separated from the Falcon 9 launch vehicle at approximately 2100 Eastern Time. However, due to the anomaly of one of the Falcon 9's first stage engines, the rocket did not comply with a pre-planned International Space Station safety gate to allow it to execute the second burn. The satellite was deployed into an orbit that was lower than intended. Orbcom and Sierra Nevada Corporation engineers have been in contact with the satellite and are working to determine if and to the extent which the orbit can be raised to an operational orbit using the satellite's onboard propulsion system. EADS and BAE Systems have mutually agreed to end discussions of a possible merger of the two companies. Talks of a possible combination of the two businesses through a dual-listed company structure began on September 12th. In a statement, BAE Systems and EADS said the merger, quote, would have produced a combined business that would have been a greater force for competition and growth across both the commercial aerospace and defense sectors, and which would have delivered tangible benefits to all stakeholders." End quote. Discussions with the relevant governments had not reached a point where both companies could fully disclose the benefits and detailed business case for this merger. During the discussions, it had become clear that the interests of the party's government stakeholders could not be adequately reconciled with each other, 
or with the objectives that BAE Systems and EADS established for the merger. You're watching Airborne, more when we come back. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds and learning proper crosswind landing techniques. Even today, most crosswind landing skills are learned through trial and error, sometimes with disastrous results. Believe it or not, the most common contributing factor in weather-related accidents each year is crosswinds. The second most common factor is wind gusts. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. It teaches pilots the proper techniques to meet and beat these top two causes of weather-related landing accidents. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in challenging crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird flight simulations, the Redbird X-Wind SE, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website or our podcast, drop us an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. High winds in the New Mexico desert forced the postponement of Felix Baumgartner's attempt to break records both for skydiving altitude and freefall speed on Tuesday. The launch of the Red Bull Stratus capsule from the desert outside Roswell, New Mexico was stopped at 11.42 local time, just before Felix Baumgartner's giant 30 million cubic foot balloon had been fully inflated and made ready for takeoff. From early morning, the team postponed the launch due to strong winds at 700 feet, the balloon's top, waiting for the right weather window to open. The launch was scheduled for 11.40, the balloon inflation had begun, and then gusty winds picked up and made the launch impossible. Felix Baumgartner is trying to undertake a stratospheric balloon flight to more than 120,000 feet and attempt a history-making freefall jump where he would become the first man to break the speed of sound in freefall. The next attempt to launch the capsule with Baumgartner aboard is currently set for Sunday. This year's America's Challenge gas balloon race is in the history books. ANN's Glenn Moyer has that story. After high winds delayed the launch for 24 hours, the 2012 America's Challenge gas balloon race finished in grand style. A worldwide helium shortage limited the field this year to a mere five balloons in an event that usually numbers a dozen or more competitors. For the first time in its 17-year history, the race was flown exclusively by hydrogen-filled balloons. Despite the limited field, the international flavor was there with teams from the UK and Russia joining the three American teams. Almost immediately after launch last Sunday evening, race officials predicted a possible flight to the East Coast, and that's just what happened. Mark Sullivan and Sherry White are the unofficial winners, having ended their flight near Beulahville, North Carolina. Their flight of about 1,627 miles in slightly more than 62 hours is the fourth longest in race history, and a personal best for both pilots who competed as a team often in gas events. It is also their second win, having taken the challenge in 2008. The apparent second-place team of Leonid Tutkayev of Russia and Wilhelm Eimers of Germany landed near Elkton, Virginia, having covered 1,555 miles in exactly one hour less than Sullivan and White. The flight is the fifth longest in race history and may establish a Russian gas balloon distance record. Peter Cuneo and Barbara Fricke, who won the challenge in 2001 and 2010, also flew a personal best of 1,455 miles, landing near Ridgeland, South Carolina. The British team landed near Sturgis, Kentucky, traveling over 1,050 miles, while Americans Mike Wallace and Kevin Brylman covered 780 miles and landed near Lamani, Iowa. All five teams are now driving back to Albuquerque, where on Saturday night the results will be finalized and awards will be presented in a grand banquet. I'm Glenn Moyer, reporting from Albuquerque, New Mexico, for Airborne and the Aero News Network. Continental Motors has been found not to be liable for an accident that resulted in the fatal injury of a Louisville, Kentucky man in 2008. 
A jury in Mobile, Alabama, where the company is based, determined that the accident was not caused by a manufacturing defect in the crankshaft. The online news site AL.com reports that defense attorneys for Continental argued that the failure was due to mistakes made by the company that had overhauled the engine of the Beach 36. The NTSB probable cause report, which is not admissible as evidence in court, indicates that the accident was the result of the pilot's continued operation of the aircraft with known deficiencies. Contributing to this accident was the improper sealing of the engine case during overhaul. The suit was brought by Natalie Freeman, the widow of the pilot fatally injured in the accident. Her attorneys argued that the crankshaft failed on the airplane, causing it to go down. Freeman's attorneys say they will likely appeal the jury's ruling because the judge would not allow the panel to hear testimony about other crankshaft failures on Continental engines. The Government Accountability Office said in a recently released study that the FAA could do more to get to the root cause of the high number of accidents involving GA aircraft and the recommendations involve gathering more data about pilots and their airplanes. The study acknowledged that the FAA has embarked on several initiatives to meet its goal of reducing the fatal general aviation accident rate by 2018, and that the number of fatal accidents has decreased between 1999 and 2011. The GAO says the FAA administrator should be required to collect and maintain data on each certificated pilot's recurrent training, and the data should be updated at regular intervals. The GAO goes on to say that the agency should collect data on the number of hours that general aviation aircraft fly over a period of time in a way that minimizes the impact on the GA community such as by collecting the data during registration renewals or at annual maintenance inspections. Finally this week, Piper Aircraft and the Piper Cubs year-long 75th anniversary celebration will culminate with a gala customer fly-in in Vero Beach, Florida on November 9th through the 11th. The invitation-only weekend features a welcome reception, vendor exhibits, aircraft static display, customer awards, facility tours, a history lesson from Piper's official historian, a Piper meet-off, and a send-off pancake breakfast. Piper has been celebrating its history all year long. Over 100 Piper Cubs turned the EAA AirVenture 2012 flight line into a field of yellow. As aviation's largest gathering, celebrated the iconic aircraft's 75th anniversary. And the winner of the Win the Cub sweepstakes at Oshkosh, Jeff Parnell, has taken delivery of his airplane, a restored 1940 Piper J3 Cub. Parnell is the editor-at-large at World Air Show News Magazine and has a flight school in Wisconsin. Congratulations, Jeff. Well, that's our program for Friday, October 12th. Quick, concise, and convenient, you're always up to date when you're airborne with Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale, thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next Tuesday with another edition of Airborne.